Um, we're going to go ahead and talk about B-cell development today. Um, and remember the problem set due today by five. Um, also, remember that we have the flow cytometry problems um, due on Friday by five. Um, let me know if you have questions about things, and you'll be getting an email from me within the next couple of days with a link to a doodle poll um, to set up a review session um, because our first exam will be a week from today. Um, so far, we've been talking about um, BDJ recombination, and we've kind of been focused on BDJ recombination at this level of thinking about exactly what was going on with the DNA and the individual chromosomes. But in thinking about B cell development, um, we're really kind of zooming out a little bit, taking a step backwards, and remembering that all of this process is happening in a B cell. Um, and so now we're basically going to be taking um, these same steps that we've seen for BDJ recombination and putting them into a cell. Um, and thinking about how the cell times this, how the cell sets this up, all of those kind of details. So now we're into the B cell instead of just thinking about the DNA itself. B cell development is part of this process of hematopoiesis. Um, so this is the version of the hematopoiesis figure from a previous edition of your textbook. Um, and remember that hematopoiesis, as I mentioned to you before, is the development of blood cells. Um, all of our blood cells, be they red blood cells or white blood cells, um, develop from the same original stem cell, the hematopoietic stem cell. And that stem cell can then develop down these sort of different branches to become all of our different types of innate or adaptive cell types, or to develop into our red blood cells. Um, when I think about hematopoiesis, when I think about the fact that I am doing hematopoiesis right now, another one of those things to tell my mom when she's like, why aren't you doing anything? Um, I usually think about bone marrow. And typically, um, we think about hematopoiesis happening in the bone marrow because largely from, you know, after we're born, all of our hematopoiesis happens in the bone marrow and it's happening for the rest of our lives there. Um, before that point in time, um, before birth, we do see hematopoiesis happening in some other locations um, in places like the yolk sac or the fetal liver or spleen. Um, but eventually, everything shifts to becoming uh, bone marrow. Those developing um, immune cells, and really all of our immune cells, pretty much all of the cells that we see here, um, are relatively rapidly dividing cells. And the reason why I mention that is that there are certain treatments that someone can have um, that will kill all of their rapidly dividing cells. Um, the one that sort of comes up here is radiation. So if someone has radiation for um, cancer therapy, the idea is that you're killing the rapidly dividing cancer cells by inducing um, DNA damage. But a side effect is that you kill all of the other rapidly dividing cells in the body, which includes all of your white blood cells. Um, there are a few other cell types. What we can, this is also true with some other types of treatments, though radiation is the one that we'll mention here for now. Um, and what you can notice is that if we have this mouse who had radiation, um, and we just left this mouse, let it hang out in its mouse cage, um, that mouse would die because we basically, with that irradiation, killed the mouse's entire immune system, and eventually that mouse would get some kind of infection and die. However, if we actually transplant some bone marrow cells from another mouse, so we do a bone marrow transplant 
into this mouse, we can restore hematopoiesis and that mouse will live. So I told you on the previous slide that the bone marrow is the site of hematopoiesis and in fact bone marrow cells can be transferred among individuals to rebuild their immune system. And so there are lots of things that might happen that could destroy your immune system. We could actually give you bone marrow cells and regrow an immune system from scratch. You don't get any of the benefits of like memory or anything like that since you're developing it from scratch, but you do get this development. Um, and you can see in this image that it's showing um, this mouse getting uh, 200,000 bone marrow cells. Um, and this uh, basically, rebuilding the, the mouse's entire immune system. Um, I've done some of these bone marrow transplantation experiments, and one thing that is not displayed very well on this image is that the injection that you have to do on the mouse is actually pretty hard. Um, it takes uh, quite a bit of practice to, to do this exact injection right, and um, people usually don't do it totally perfectly. Um, I say that because um, on the next slide, I'm going to show you an experiment that someone did based upon this. Um, and I think that one of the things that happens in the experiment, I think it, it, the, the, the difficulty um, in injection, I think, comes up here. Because if you notice, our bone marrow cells are shown as being a big mixture of different cell types. There are a bunch of different cells that are in the bone marrow. They include the stem cell, it's labeled here helpfully as S, that hematopoietic stem cell that can develop into other um, cells, but it also includes a number of other cell types that just like to live in the bone marrow as a place to live. Um, and so scientists wanted to figure out how many stem cells does it take? How many stem cells do you need to transfer? to regrow an entire immune system in a mouse. So they did some experiments, first where they just purified out 20 stem cells. And when they just purified 20 stem cells, 100% of the time, the mouse regrew its immune system. If they purified 10 stem cells, 90% of the time it worked. They purified five, about 50% of the time it worked. They purified two, 23% of the time it worked. They purified out one, about 20% of the time. That was enough to regrow the whole immune system. When I look at this, I think, to me, this says that you probably only need like one. And most of the reason why the other 80% failed was based on the injection um, and how hard that injection is. So it's like the ones that failed, failed because of the injection. If you get the injection right, it's good. So the point that I want you to see here is that it takes very, very few hematopoietic stem cells to grow a whole immune system. Um, so the hematopoietic stem cell can generate many, 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 many progeny and eventually develop into all of the cells we need of the innate and adaptive immune system. Um, development of our immune cells um, and all the parts of this hematopoiesis process are happening in primary lymphoid organs. And everything we're talking about right now has to do with the bone marrow. Um, the thymus, which is our other primary lymphoid organ, plays an important role in T cell development, and that's really the only place we're going to see it. Um, so we're solidly in the bone marrow now. So you can see that everything we're talking about for the rest of the time today and really on mostly on Wednesday, will be events that are happening in the bone marrow. Um, and much of this little overview of what you see on the left is really all information that are all events that do happen in bone marrow. Um, what you will notice is that I also put in this little image over here um, to show you sort of a B cell that's then going to um, do its development in the bone marrow. So you can see the B cell is doing stuff in the bone marrow. Um, remember that this is antigen independent. So we are not really dealing with antigens yet. We have, we're still in that nice sequestered area. And you can also notice that uh, you have about 5 million B cells per day 
that finish this process. And we can think um, really more on Wednesday, if 5 million finish, how many had to start? Um, but the moral of the story is you are doing a lot of this process. Um, and of course, ah, um, we are in that sequestered area of the primary lymphoid organ and are in the absence of antigen. So we're doing this diversification process in the absence of antigen here. Um, so one of the questions that we can think about first has to do with why bone marrow? What is it about bone marrow that makes bone marrow special? One part of this why bone marrow and what makes bone marrow special is something that you can um, already kind of guess from the information that I have here and the things that I've already told you today. So one reason is because we can think of at least the bone marrow as being kind of the the place before the antigens. That's meh true. But we'll but if you want to think of it as the place before the antigens, at least at the beginning, that's okay. So that's one reason. But there's one other reason why um, bone marrow is really important. And this in fact, really applies to the thymus too, but we're just thinking about bone marrow here. Um, and this is going to kind of lead us on this little almost diversion that we have to talk about before we get into some uh, additional information. One thing that I want you to know about every lymphocyte that's developing, whether that developing lymphocyte is a B cell or a T cell, is that that developing lymphocyte is very, very needy. That developing lymphocyte, if it does not get signals, is going to die. And that developing lymphocyte kind of needs constant little pats on the head. You're doing a good job. You should stay alive. You're doing a good job. You should stay alive. And throughout the life of our developing lymphocytes in primary lymphoid organs like the bone marrow, those cells really need a lot of pats on the head. This makes it really important that we're in the bone marrow because the bone marrow provides a lot of growth factors to keep those developing B cells alive. So the bone marrow sort of is a place where there are lots and lots and lots of the growth factors that tell the cells, you're doing a good job, don't die. You're doing a good job, don't die. Um, the, and so you can see this here. You can see in the yellow at the top figure from your textbook, we've got a developing B cell. In gray, we have bone marrow cells. And what you'll notice is that bone marrow has a bunch of different proteins on its cell surface that can interact with the developing B cell to keep telling that developing B cell it's doing a good job and it should stay alive. And we've got a similar picture um, from another textbook at the bottom. The developing B cells are in various shades of green. And you can see those developing B cells interacting um, with all sorts of different cells in the bone marrow in order to get those types of signals known as the survival signals. Um, the one signal that I will call out by name is the signal that's being made here called IL-7. Um, IL-7 is a cytokine that can act on developing B cells. Hint, hint, it's gonna act on developing T cells too. Um, but it acts on developing B cells and gives them a nice signal to survive um, and keep going through this process. Uh, so what we're gonna be thinking about really for the next two, rest of today and on Wednesday, will be the phases in the life of a B cell that are shown here in yellow and that are happening in the yellow organ, the bone marrow. 
Um, and so we're going to be thinking about how we do VDJ recombination um, as well as selection processes. Again, we are not yet dealing with infection, which is happening later on. As I mentioned to you before, developing lymphocytes, and in particular for our purposes right now, developing B cells are really needy. They need to get a lot of signals to tell them to survive. And before I can give you the rest of the details of B cell development, I need to tell you a little bit about signaling in B cells so that you can understand where those signals are going to come from throughout B cell development. And so we have to think a little bit about how one activates a B cell. Um, it turns out that, I know this is going to be shocking, the way that one activates a B cell is through the B cell receptor. And so we're going to have, we have this B cell receptor. Remember that that is just a version of the antibody that is bound at the plasma membrane of the B cell. And that is what's going to activate our B cell. Here you can see um, the details of this as well, that the B cell receptor is really just the antibody with a transmembrane domain. Um, I haven't talked a ton about that piece yet. We'll see a little bit more of it on Wednesday. But basically, after the constant region, um, there are two different polydenylation sites. So there are two different places that we can add a poly A tail. One of them, allows us to have a transmembrane domain, one of them does not. And so we can do RNA splicing to have two different RNAs, make two different proteins that are otherwise identical, except for whether or not they have a transmembrane domain. All right, the next couple slides, I always, I, I don't think I know how to explain the next slide without interpretive dance, so I guess I have to stand up. Um, so, um, I also need to tell you a little bit about kind of some cell biology of signal transduction. And I could do like a whole class of cell biology of signal transduction, but here we're going to talk about kind of the big highlights of it. Um, and we're going to think about um, some of the most famous receptors in signal transduction which are called receptor tyrosine kinases. A receptor tyrosine kinase has three parts that are important. One part is the receptor part. One part is a tyrosine amino acid. And one part is a kinase enzyme. And so very frequently, we'll have something like what is shown in these top three images going on. Our receptor might have a couple of different um, protein chains. That's pretty common. Um, and you can see those receptors drawn here. And they're often drawn in ways like this in textbooks. But there's a problem with that drawing in a textbook. What we should remember when we think about the cell, and we think specifically about the plasma membrane of the cell, is that proteins diffuse in different directions in the plasma membrane and that don't usually stay next to each other. And so those two proteins that you see there are actually diffusing it totally separate ways. Sometimes they're close, sometimes they're far. They're going in some sort of crazy pattern. Um, they're usually drawn kind of close to next to each other, because how else would you draw it and have them be in the same figure? But really, they're just like all over the place. However, if the ligand comes around, the ligand will grab onto both sides of that receptor 
and bring those receptors that were previously far apart and not next to each other, next to each other. This is known as the induced proximity model of signal transduction. We've basically made these two receptors go into proximity because they're both binding to their ligand. When the extracellular part of the receptors are brought into proximity, that means their inside, their intracellular parts, get brought into proximity too. So previously, the outsides were, these parts were not next to each other, and these weren't next to each other either. And now they're both next to each other. These inside domains have enzymatic activity. Specifically, they are a kinase. They can phosphorylate things. And now that they're close to each other, they can phosphorylate each other. So now they can add this little pink dot to each other that was not there previously. And that's because of this induced proximity. And that phosphorylation event allows further signaling to happen. And this is a pretty common way. Um, if you think about this kind of overview, this helps you with a lot of types of signal transduction. Um, the, these, of course, like I said, have um, kinase activity. And the spot that they phosphorylate is usually a tyrosine amino acid. There are reasons why it's other amino acids, but for our oversimplification today, it's a tyrosine. And so this also kind of gives us the three important parts of our receptor tyrosine kinase. There's the receptor part, the part that binds to the ligand, the tyrosine part, the part that gets phosphorylated, and the kinase part, the part that does the phosphorylation to make all this work. The bottom of this figure is basically showing you other variations on this theme where sometimes a kinase and a receptor work together. They're separate proteins, so they're different colors, but it's otherwise the same thing. Okay? So for much of this semester, if you get signal transduction at this level, you're really good. Now I want to tell you about activating the B cell receptor or activating B cells using the B cell receptor. And I want you to think about this model for comparison. So here is the B cell receptor. Um, and I'll even tell you that usually when we are doing induced proximity with our B cell receptor, we're going to induce the proximity of two B cell receptors close together. So don't worry about induced proximity. This antigen's gonna be grabbing two B cell receptors. So that's our induced proximity. I didn't want that to be like confusing that you didn't see induced proximity here. That's why I'm mentioning it. It's not like crazy important right now. But if you look at the B cell receptor, as, I've, as it's shown in this textbook, um, there's a problem, actually two problems, but one of them, we're going to talk about now one of them we're going to be like we're going to just deal with what's the problem if you look at this b cell receptor as i show it compared to my receptor tyrosine kinase shown on this slide especially the one in blue yeah joel Yeah, um, this just stops and doesn't actually have that intracellular domain. In fact, it has about three amino acids. So that's not enough to be a kinase. That's not enough to have the tyrosine to get phosphorylated. It's just not, not good enough. Um, and so the way that the B cell receptor is able to deal with this problem is that it has to rely on some help from its friends. So there are other proteins that are going to allow the B cell receptor to have this function. So instead of having one protein that is the receptor, the tyrosine, and the kinase, 
we've got this amazing B cell receptor that we went through all this VDJ work to make, which is just the receptor. And we have to have other proteins provide the tyrosine and the kinase. I'm basically going to tell you there's a protein with a kinase right now. I'm not going to get super into the kinase at the moment. I'm just going to say, I promise there's a kinase. But for the tyrosine, I'm going to say a little bit more. So the B cell receptor um, actually has to have another protein called a co-receptor that travels with it to signal. And the co-receptor for the B cell receptor is this two-chained protein called IG-alpha and IG-beta. You can see that it doesn't really have much in the way of an extracellular domain, um, but it has a nice long intracellular domain. IG-alpha and IG-beta are also sometimes called CD79A and CD79B. So we've got both sets of names right here. And the key thing about IG-alpha and IG-beta is that they contain these domains called ITAMs. I'm going to tell you what ITAM stands for. Honestly, one part of it matters to you today. Some other parts of it will matter to you later in like later kinds of cells, but really only one thing matters today. So ITAM stands for immunotyrosine-based activation motif. The only thing that matters for you for this point in time is tyrosine. <laughs> This is the thing that has the tyrosine in it. This is where the tyrosine is. Um, and so um, the B cell receptor is pretty cool. It actually um, has, uh, it actually diffuses in the membrane with Ig alpha and Ig beta. Um, it's really rare for cells to, for proteins to diffuse in a membrane together. Um, I really like this story because um, one of my friends in grad school actually figured out how this happens. Um, and so it's, it's pretty cool with some charged residues that allow the two to associate and diffuse together. Um, and, but it's specifically the B cell receptor needing those co-receptors, Ig alpha and Ig beta. Um, the B cell receptor will signal when it's in some kind of induced proximity. So you can see the antigen will pull together two B cell receptors. You can see the kinase will then phosphorylate those ITAMs and allow us to do some signal transduction. I'm going to show you in the next slide, and you're going to look at the next slide and freak out. There is very little that I want, I mean, not very little, but don't stress about the next slide. I'm showing it to you for a reason that will make sense way later and not be huge right now. After you get that phosphorylation, there are lots more signal transduction events. I don't care that you know what those signal transduction events are right now. What you can notice is that you get things like changes in gene expression and differentiation. Later on in the semester, we're going to talk about T cell activation. And we're going to talk about signal transduction that happens with T-cell activation. And we're going to learn all sorts of different proteins that happen in T-cell activation. After you learn those T-cell activation proteins, if you come back to this slide and look at this slide, you'll be like, wait a minute, it looks really similar. And in fact, it does look really similar. And that's why I feel like I only should teach it to you once instead of teaching it to you twice. Um, so. It, there are a bunch of uh, signal transduction proteins. They give you gene expression. They give you differentiation. They give you all of the events we're going to be seeing today um, that you don't really want to have to worry about them right now. Um, as far as the kinase is concerned, um, all I'm going to say is that, again, the B cell receptor relies on some help from its friends. There are a number of other proteins that are a part of this process that can bring in the kinase. And these are other types of co-receptors. In the case of the B cell, 
there are options for what that co-receptor is. And that's why I don't want to get super into it right now. One of those options is actually a complement receptor. So complement can help B cells be activated better. Um, but there can be a number of those different co-receptors. And the specific kinases that are involved will vary based on which co-receptor we're talking about. But know that this B cell receptor that we're seeing here is going to be key in activating our B cell and giving our B cell its survival signals, its little pats on the head, so that that B cell can keep going throughout the development process. All right. So we are going to now sort of go into some specific details of B cell development in the bone marrow. Um, this is the image from your textbook looking at hematopoiesis and what's going on in the bone marrow. And so what you can notice is that we start out with a hematopoietic stem cell that is pluripotent. That means it has the ability to turn into many different cell types. And you can see that it makes some choices. Like at first it makes a choice. Do I want to be a myeloid cell or a lymphoid cell? And then it makes a choice. Do I want to be a B cell or do I want to be a T cell? Um, and those things are shown here. Um, this is the same uh, image on the left. And on the right, you can kind of see this idea of our hematopoietic stem cell that ha could have done many choices, then said, no, I'm going to be a lymphocyte. And then says, you know what, I'm going to be a B cell. And so really, when we're starting this process, we're going to be starting with cells around here that have already decided, I would like to be a B cell when I grow up. We're not going to deal with how the cell decides if it wants to be a lymphocyte or a myeloid cell, and, or how the cell sort of makes some of those earlier decisions. We're in the bone marrow. This cell has already gone through some um, differentiation such that it is going to become a B cell. And when we start out with this B cell, we're going to start out with the first stage being a cell called a pro B cell. Um, and so we are going to be first thinking about a pro B cell. And so here is our pro B cell. Okay. So you can notice sort of this, in fact, you can start to see this is listed as pre pro B cell and pro B cell. We could actually develop, like, divide the pro B cell into a couple of different stages. So as I write down different stages on the board, I'm, I am going to kind of write like thing number one it does versus thing number two. Um, so, and some people will divide them up. And so you can see, you know, the, this textbook is putting that pro B cell into a couple different groups. I'm just going to say the first thing it does, the second thing it does, and just call the whole thing pro B cell. Um, the pro B cell is going to be really doing two major events. One of those events that the pro B cell is going to do is that it is going to do rearrangement of the heavy chain D to J. So we're going to have heavy chain D and heavy chain J get put together. And so you can see DJ chain. Um, here it's, it's putting together D and J. And then the second thing that the pro B cell is going to do is it's going to put a V with that DJ. So it's going to put a V onto the DJ that it has made. Once we have done D to J recombination 
and then B to DJ recombination. What do we have? What have we done once we've done those two steps? What could we call the, that whole process of those two steps? Yeah. Of what? Of the heavy chain. We, we made a heavy chain, right? We did the two steps of making a heavy chain. So we've now got a heavy chain gene, right? The DNA for a heavy chain. Once we have the DNA for a heavy chain, what do you think we're going to do with that DNA for the heavy chain? We've put the promoter and enhancer kind of close together. So we might, what, what might we do to that DNA? Yeah. We might transcribe it into RNA. And then what might we do with that RNA? What do you think? We're going to make some protein. We're going to translate it into protein. So now we got a protein. What do you think we might do with that protein once we've made it? We're going to take that protein and we're going to put it on the surface of the cell because it's the protein that's supposed to go on the surface of the cell, right? So we're going to put it up on the surface of the cell. When we put that protein on the surface of the cell, that means the cell gets called something else. Okay, so that's the sort of the definition of the next type of cell, is the one that has a heavy chain on its surface. So a pro B cell, does it have heavy chain on its surface? No, because it hasn't made it yet. It's like point in life is making the heavy chain. <laughs> but the next step of B cell, next stage of B cell is going to have a heavy chain on its surface. And, and we're going to call that one a pre B cell. Oftentimes, We think about types of B cells based on whether they have a heavy chain and whether they have a light chain. Mu is the name of a heavy chain. Kappa is the name of a light chain. I just picked one of the light chains because there's two. So if we have a pro B cell, does the pro B cell have a heavy chain on its surface? No. So where is it here if mu, mu is heavy chain? So is it in a left part or a right part? It should be on the left, because it has no heavy chain, right? OK, kappa's light chain. Does it have light chain on its surface? No, we haven't even talked about light chain yet. So there's no way it has light chain. So then pro B cells would be there in a full cytometry plot if we were trying to find them. And we would know that the next, that our cell was ready to be the next cell, made it to the next phase, which is called a pre B cell if it has a heavy chain on the surface. Do you think it's going to have a light chain on the surface? Now? We still haven't talked about light chain yet, so no. So now we're going to have this cell that has heavy chain but no light chain. So let's imagine this is what happened. Our cell has done this process, and it makes the heavy chain. Now what that cell is going to do is it's going to Put that heavy chain on the surface. Well, really, it's going to put two. Fine. We put that heavy chain on the surface and try to test it and say, did I make a good heavy chain? Did I go through all this work and do it right? Or did I fail? That's really what's going to happen here. And we're going to talk in a second about what I mean by fail and what it could be for a fail. Um, if the cell was correct, it didn't fail, it did a good job, which what we want to have happen here is we want the cell to get a signal through this receptor that it got on it, that now has on its surface. It's going to get a signal, and that's going to be its little pat on the head. Good job. You did a good job of the first step. And that's going to tell the cell it can go to the second step. But we have a problem. If you look at my little drawing of my cell there, um, and remember that I told you when you make 
uh, an antibody or a B cell receptor. You only really get that folding to be correct when you have heavy chains and light chains. So um, is there a problem here? Yeah, what's, what's the problem? There's no light chain. So, like, it doesn't work. The cell hasn't made the light chain yet. So instead, at this point, the cell makes a fake light chain just so that it can put the heavy chain on the surface and test it. Because why go through all the work of making light chains if you already failed? Like, you want to find out you did the first step right before you did the second step, before you did the second step. So the cell goes ahead and makes this fake light chain. This is known as the surrogate light chain. Um, the surrogate light chain is uh, shown over here on the left. Um, it contains two proteins called V pre B and lambda 5. Please note that lambda 5 is different than the lambda light chain. It's really annoying phrasing. Um, and so these to get, so when you have the surrogate light chain plus the heavy chain, we call that the pre B cell receptor. And the pre B cell receptor being on the surface is the thing that defines a cell as a pre B cell. So the cell is going to put the pre B cell receptor on its surface and it's going to test the heavy chain and see if it correctly made a heavy chain. And you can see this here as well. The definition of a pre B cell is that it expresses the pre B cell receptor. Um, and so here you can see our pro B cell. It has no heavy or light chains on its surface. And then we make the heavy chain and we put it on the surface of the cell as a pre B cell. Now, now it's called a pre B cell because it has this on the surface. And this is the pre B cell receptor, and we can distinguish by flow cytometry. So, again, here we're thinking about this going right. Um, and one other thing that I want to briefly point out is that I told you that the um, antibody or the B cell receptor is only able to see antigen when we have a heavy and light chain combination. So if we don't have a real light chain, how do we see antigen or what's going on with this? Like we can fold a protein, we made like a little scaffold, but can we see antigen? We actually don't totally have an answer to this, but what we think is we think that the surrogate light chain has like a little tail that grabs another surrogate light chain and allows cross-linking to happen that way. So two different B cell receptors get pulled together by these tails on the surrogate light chain is what we think happens. So, we, so this is not happening because of antigen. This is just, are these proteins like legitimate, functional, real proteins? And if they are, if we made a good heavy chain, yay, we made a good heavy chain, the cell is going to get some additional signals. One of the signals that the cell is going to get is that the cell is going to get a signal to survive. So here's our pat in the head. You did a good job. You can live. This cell is also going to get another important kind of signal. Um, and that signal is a s signal to proliferate. So that cell is going to get a signal to say, not only did you do such a good job, you should live. You did such a good job, you can make more copies of yourself. So that we can get many copies of this cell with a good heavy chain. I'm actually going to call this 2B.
You did a good job. Make many copies of yourself. Now, what's really key here is if we have many copies of this cell with the good heavy chain, each of the progeny could make a different light chain. And then we get lots of combos of heavy chains plus light chains. So basically, we're like, OK, we got one with a good heavy chain. Now we're going to like make many of that so we can pair it with different light chains. But you can see I wrote that as 2B because there's another sort of related thing that has to happen. Before the cell can proliferate, it needs to put away the scissors. We need to get rid of the RAG protein before the cell proliferates. So we have to turn off RAG. And so you can see turning off RAG is right here. Um, Why do we need to turn off RAG at this point? Yeah, Josh. Um, since you already have a good heavy chain, mm -hmm. you don't want you don't want to even have RAG in the facility because it could accidentally cut something, make something wrong. And yeah, you also. When you do proliferation, that is like when you're going to start copying and doing stuff to all your other DNA. If you're going to copy DNA and like do cell division, you don't want any risk of that rag cutting enzyme around. So if you're going to proliferate, absolutely no rag can be around. So now you're going to start doing other DNA stuff so rag goes away so that you don't do some DNA damage during the cell cycle and during proliferation. And you can see that here, too. In our pro B cell, you can see we had RAG on, RAG plus. <laughs> and you can see that in our earliest pre B cells, we turn RAG off. Turning RAG off also leads to another piece. So we've had survival, we had Turning off rag, then we had proliferation. We also have another thing that's going to happen here. And this is again a consequence of turning off rag, but it's a this is the one that like messes everybody up a little bit. And happily, I drew on the board. Um, this other thing that's going to happen is something called allelic exclusion. And specifically, this is heavy chain allelic exclusion. So if we get a good signal through our heavy chain, then we will do allelic exclusion. So what does the word exclusion mean? What does it mean to exclude something? Yeah. To leave, to leave out. So you're going to leave something out. Allelic kind of looks like allele, right? What's allele? What's an allele? So I might think of an allele as like a version of a gene. So you're leaving out some version of a gene with allelic exclusion. So this image shows you the heavy chain. And I've also drawn the heavy chain on the board. And the heavy chain is on chromosome 14. This has the kappa light chain on chromosome 2, the lambda light chain on chromosome 22. I've drawn all of them up here. Though right now, we're really talking about heavy chain um, on chromosome 14. OK. Olivia, in all of your cells, 
How many copies of chromosome 14 do you have? Hmm? Two? How do you have two? Where did you get the two from? One from each parent, right? One from your mom and one from your dad. Look, they're pink and blue. I did it on purpose. <laughs> so here you can see each of these chromosomes and what it really looks like in each of your cells is you've got one of each from each parent. So let's imagine I'm picking this one because it's lower and I'm lazy and don't feel like reaching very high. All right, well, let's imagine that we first, our first step was to put a D with a J, right? So we joined this D and this J on this chromosome. Do you think this chromosome also did that D and that J? No, no it's, it's totally random. This chromosome could have done this D and this J. Is this chromosome going to, all right, so now we pick a V for this one. We'll pick this V. And this chromosome might pick this V. What's going to happen in this case? Yeah, Josh. Your B cell is going to make two totally different heavy chains. That's not how this works. That Each B cell makes one individual heavy chain. What if one of those heavy chains is the bestest heavy chain ever for SARS-CoV-2, and the other one gives you multiple sclerosis? Do you want to kill that B cell or keep it? Huh? You don't know. That would be bad, right? You really want the cell to be one or the other. None of this two business. You want to be one or the other, and then you decide what to do with that B cell. So this is really bad. You can't have this happen. And so what you have to do is actually basically like a race. When one B cell finishes a V, D, and a J, it puts that protein up on the cell surface. And that turns off RAG and says, eh, 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 no more heavy chains. Heavy chain, you're done. Other allele, other chromosome, you're excluded. You may not finish. And so allelic exclusion means that we only actually complete the process of VDJ rearrangement on one chromosome. We make the protein. And if that protein is good and we get a signal, that makes it, that actually inhibits the other chromosome from being able to finish its recombination. So you only can get one heavy chain finished. in order to make sure that your B cell only has one heavy chain. And so we get allelic exclusion at the heavy chain. If we didn't have allelic exclusion at the heavy chain, this is actually showing if we didn't have it, yeah, this is, this is just heavy chain. You could see, in fact, you could even get these like weird mix and match antibodies that are half one heavy chain and half the, it would be a disaster. This is, here's what happens because we have allelic exclusion. All the receptors and all the antibodies from one B cell are the same. On the right is what would happen if we didn't have allelic exclusion, and that would be bad. So we first are going to have survival. Yay. Then we're going to turn off RAG. This is important because it's going to allow proliferation. It's also going to allow us to do heavy chain allelic exclusion. Um, so all of that is yay. Um, there are going to eventually be two more things that are going to happen. And so remember how I said, how I've mentioned kind of like early and late pro B cells, and I, there also could be early and late pre B cells. We're kind of getting into a late pre B cell now. I'm going to tell you the events. But then we're going to talk about what it means for the heavy chain to fail and what happens if the heavy chain fails in this point. 
So the next event that could happen, and I'll just, well, okay, number four is that we're going to do We're going to make light chain. <laughs> Yay, light chain. We probably needed to turn rag back on. I guess technically this is four and this is five. So we turn so we're going to turn eventually we're going to turn rag back on. But there's one we're going to do something else and we're going to have this light chain. There's one other thing we're going to do in this case. We have been, up until this point, making a lot of surrogate light chain. Do we need to make surrogate light chain anymore? No, we're done with it. We're past that point in our lives. So we're also going to shut off surrogate light chain production. So we're going to turn rag on, turn surrogate light chain off. Um, so all of these are going to kind of be things that are going to happen as a result of signals through the pre-B cell receptor. Of course, like I said, before we can get to, you know, hooray, all this is great, we, we had to have a successful light chain. So now we have to think about what if or a successful heavy chain. Now we have to think about what happens if the heavy chain fails. Um, and first, I'm going to show you kind of the, I'm going to show you a couple of slides of what happens when the heavy chain fails. But then we're going to talk about what the heck it means for a heavy chain to fail. And so, one of, so basically what happens is that you can see we do D to J rearrangement. And then one chromosome completes its V to DJ and puts that protein up on the cell surface. If that's a good protein, then the cell gets a signal and survives to be a pre-B cell. But if the cell doesn't get a signal, if that was not a good protein, we can't get a signal. If it can't get a signal, it can't do all those steps I was telling you on the previous page, including it can't turn off RAG1 and RAG2. And so now we're going to rearrange, finish the second chromosome. So the cell, in fact, gets two tries to do to make a heavy chain correctly. So if it fails the first time, or if it succeeds the first time, it's a pre-B cell, it moves on to pre-B cell life. If it fails, then the second chromosome is allowed to continue, and perhaps that one will work. And if that one works, then again, the cell gets to live happily ever after as a pre-B cell. It's also possible that one could fail, too. And if that one fails, too, then the cell's out of luck. It's used up both its heavy chain chances, and it dies, because it cannot get that nice pat on the head signal to survive. And notice that this lists about half of the developing cells dying. So for you to get 10 million or uh, 5 million coming out of the bone marrow, you had to have way more than that here starting because a bunch of them are going to die because they make a bad heavy chain. Um, this is the version of that from your textbook. This is a version from another textbook. Um, for some reason, this is the one that's in my head, so I feel like I have to show it. So here's our cell. It's going to do D to J. Then it's going to do B to J of one chromosome. Possibly it will work, and it will get to be a pre-B cell. Possibly it will fail. If it fails, Perhaps and it made a non-productive allele, it will tr could try again. And maybe it will work. And maybe it will fail. And if it fails and makes a non-productive allele the second time, then it dies. So that leaves us this question of what the heck is a non-productive allele? And why exactly can the heavy chain fail? Um, I will tell you, I'm going to go back and tell you this, and some of you guys are going to kick yourself as I tell you this. Um, just so that you know, this is my 11th year teaching at Drew, so this is my 11th time doing this class at Drew, and I've done it a couple few times before that in different forms. Um, the thing that I'm going to tell you, I have had one student catch once. 
So don't feel bad. Only one student ever figured it out before what I'm going to tell you right now. Um, so we are going to do VDJ recombination of DJ, VDDJ that we're seeing here. And we saw we're, we're going to, you know, have those nice, precise cuts at the RSS. We're going to get the hairpins. And we're going to get P and N nucleotide addition, right? How many, and we're also going to potentially get some exonucleolytic cleavage, where we remove some base pairs. How many P nucleotides do we add? Yeah, Grace. Doesn't it vary based on like the overhang? It varies based on the overhang, usually between 0 and 5 on each end. So between 0 and 10. Um, and then how many N nucleotides do you add? The correct answer is some. <laughs> How many things do you remove with the exonucleolytic cleavage? Some. Some, maybe. Zero to some in both of those cases. So if we add up all of those numbers, um, how many base pairs get changed at that junction site? We put together the adds and subtracts. All that. How many base pairs are changed? Some. Is the answer some again? There's not a specific number. OK, now here is the really important question. Is the, our very precise number of some divisible by 3? What do you think? What do you think? So you say, shouldn't it be? Why do you say, shouldn't it be? Because three nucleotides make up an amino acid. So, you know, if, if we add in two nucleotides total, then we've just pushed all of the rest of this out of frame, right? And maybe we get a stop codon before we even get a constant region. So is it possible that we could add or subtract a number of base pairs that's not a multiple of three? Yeah, we totally can. And every time we do that, we result in a heavy chain that may have a stop codon and may be out of frame and may actually be a protein that doesn't go all the way to the end and doesn't have a transmembrane domain and isn't like an actual good heavy chain protein. It's just like a crappy protein. Because we're adding and subtracting base pairs at random. And so sometimes we are actually going to destroy the gene when adding and subtracting those base pairs because the addition may not be in a multiple of three and may push us out of frame. That's the most common way that you can make a bad heavy chain. There are some other ways, but that one is like by far the most common. And so you can imagine that we've got to try this once on one chromosome. Maybe we actually get a full heavy chain. Maybe we get a protein that gets all the way to the end and has a transmembrane domain and gets to be a receptor and can do a signal. Or maybe we trash that one. That protein's never going to work. So it's never going to signal. It's never going to um, allelically exclude. And the other chromosome tries. <laughs> Again, maybe it works. You can imagine kind of like one in three chance. <laughs> maybe it doesn't work, in which case the cell's out of luck. The cell can't make heavy chain anymore. And since it had already decided it was going to live the B cell life, it's done because it can't make a heavy chain. And so the frame shift piece of this becomes really important. And that's the biggest way that we can see the cell, um, B cells uh, failing. I point this out again. This is all completely random. And one thing that I hope that you will notice throughout this entire semester is that there is one word that should not necessarily be applied to the immune system, which is like efficient and not wasteful. <laughs> 
the number of times we make something and then kill it, like we, we do this recombination and then we're like, ah, oh, it failed, kill the cell, is actually pretty huge in the immune system. And so here you're seeing one example of that, but we're going to see lots more examples of that going forward. Once we've gotten those, uh, all of the things that come from the pre-B cell receptor, um, you can see that we're going to turn RAG back on and we're going to make the light chain. And so here you can see, oh my gosh, we turned RAG back on. <laughs> and it's time for us to start making the light chain. Um, and that is what our pre-B cell is doing, is making the light chain. Um, you can see we've got our pre-BCR on the surface. Um, and we are going to make and test the light chain on Wednesday um, and finish all of the kind of testing that the B cell goes through while it's in the primary lymphoid organ before it's allowed out into the rest of the body. Um, and so I will see you guys on Wednesday. Remember your problem set by five.